We live in a world where the naturally aspirated V8 and manual transmission is disappearing. And then Ford comes along and releases the seventh generation Mustang, including a brand new moniker, the Dark Horse. In this video, we're going to talk to the chief engineer, the designers and executives about why and how this car was created and the challenges of keeping this brand going. Transu. I am currently the Mustang Chief Program Engineer. To me, this job is a dream job. I absolutely love Mustang. Our six in our family all work at Ford. So I, I love Ford. I mentioned before, my dog's name is Shelby. So I, you know, they say bleeds Ford blue. That'd be me, for sure. Um, and to get the opportunity to lead the team on such an iconic product it is just an amazing honor. So I grew up driving a V8. Um, I learned to drive on a Mustang GT 5 liter back in the day when I was 16 years old. Um, I personally have been a Mustang enthusiast my whole life. I think there's nothing like a naturally aspirated V8. The, the exhaust note on it is unique, in particular on Mustang. I always say when I close my eyes and Mustang drives by, I know immediately that's a Mustang. And so, yeah, there's a lot of um, shift in the industry, right, as we're, we're moving into electrification. Uh, I personally am excited that we're leaning into the V8. We've been very intentional about how we manage our CO2. We have a BEV Mustang. We also offer a 2.3 liter Mustang and a 5 liter V8 Mustang. So we've got a complete um, Mustang family that kind of satisfies what anybody might want in a Mustang. Uh, I'm Jim Owens, and I'm the Mustang brand manager. I've been doing this since about, been around Mustang since about 2000. I uh, started in SVT and Team Ford racing aspect of it. Uh, spent four years working for Carroll Shelby. Um, left Ford, went to work for Carroll, and then came back to launch the Boss 302 uh, Gen 6. The seventh generation has a new nameplate in it, and it's the first new one in 21 years, right? 2001, the bullet, now the bullet, you know, we've gone through three generations of it. I, I can't believe that was the last new one. Um, but in the seventh generation, it was about taking that foundational element, um, the thing that resonated, and then projecting it to the future. So if you look up Dark Horse, right? The definition of it, it was the horse you didn't see coming. How pertinent to the launch of the seventh generation Mustang. Now the badging itself, I mean, that's the first time we've done a forward facing horse, right? If you think about it, we've done the left to right ponies in the grills, we've done the GTs, we've done the snakes from the projecting lamps. That's the first time we've done a full facing horse. Now that front facing horse, you can see the design on it and that like the nostrils flaring like, and if you think of a performance like a horse that is racing, when they're coming in, they're actually like breathing in that air and taking that air in to make that performance better. And what better way to tie it to the dual air box induction on that five liter? I think it's cool. And it's just a story that we can tell going into the future that'll help build those names like Mach 1, like Bullet, you know, like Boss 302. It'll help create those stories for people in the future to talk about. Hi, uh, my name is Chris Walter and I am a creative design manager at Ford. Um, I've been working in, in the exterior design realm for a couple decades. I've had the opportunity to work on pretty much every Fusion on the road. Um, also the 2015 sixth generation Mustang, the Mustang 2021 Mustang Mach-E and the Mustang Mach-E GT 
and of course the seventh generation 2024 Mustang. So for the seventh gen, uh, we wanted it to be a modern interpretation of the Mustang design icon of the heritage. The sixth generation car uh, was introduced to the global market and it had more of an international flair. And uh, it was the first time that the car was sold in Europe and Asia. So it, it was really intended to uh, be accessible to more of a broad international audience. For the seventh generation car, we wanted to infuse, again, with more modern cues, uh, fresh in the car. The bones of the car are, are, are there, right? You have the proportion of the car. So the timeless proportion remained. We wanted to lower the roof. We wanted to lower the belt line significantly, but that would have just meant millions of dollars of investment. Um, and again, like I said prior, the bones of the car are great. Uh, we wanted to lean into the, the more edgy, sheer look of the car. We just felt it was a little bit more modern. Um, interesting sidebar story, when we were developing this car, we had two themes that we were designing. Um, one would have been a very nice evolution to the sixth generation Mustang. But we had another theme that was really leaning into this more of this very chiseled edge-like design. Um, we, uh, we assembled about 30 millennials and Gen Zs within the company from marketing and design to uh, take a look at both of these designs and the, the more progressive modern design was the one that uh, was favored by far. Um, we did have to work within certain constraints of carryover parts from the sixth generation. However, the seventh generation um, is uh, completely reworked uh, as far as the chassis improvements. But from an exterior design standpoint, um, all new sheet metal, um, carryover roof, uh, carryover front glass and rear glass, but other than that, the car is a clean sheet. We found ourselves talking about the heritage. We, uh, we talked about, you know, do we make this thing? Do we lean into uh, to the retro? Do we lean into the retro really hard? Or do we go on the other side of the spectrum and make it a, make it a science project? And obviously, we didn't want to do either one of those. When it comes to designing a Mustang and a company like Ford, you know, everyone has an opinion. So I'll share with you my opinions. <laughs> so um, I was inspired by a, a couple watershed Mustangs throughout the years. Uh, the 67, the 2005, and, and the 2010 as well. But what I liked about those cars, specifically the 2005 car, was the fact that it basically got back to its roots and it, it got back to um, a surface language that was a little bit more straightforward and pure, simple. It's not too gimmicky. There's not a lot of hashes and slashes on, on the surfacing. Um, you'll notice on the seventh generation Mustang, we don't really have any uh, prominent undercuts in the vehicle. We wanted to keep, again, I'm going back to those words, sheer, chiseled, uh, and edgy. Um, so those are some of my personal thoughts on design inspirations. I think, I think we ended up um, with a nice blend <laughs> of both old and new with the car. Um, you know, the dark horse that sits behind us, um, you know, possibly to some of the more purists and the Mustang owners that have been with us for many, many years are probably wondering what the dark horse is. Um, they're probably trying to understand what this is. They're probably wondering why isn't this the new Mach 1 or why isn't this the, the latest Shelby. Um, but we are trying to uh, generate some excitement and capture a new younger audience with the dark horse. And um, when we start talking about some of the styling elements, or rather, rather what I would like to say, uh, planned design elements, um, is uh, you know we have those dark accents all over the vehicle, uh, the dark tarnished accents on, on underneath the headlamps, uh, the mirror caps, um, along with the graphics, and that that really plays into that kind of sinister, kind of um, dark, uh, dark story that we're trying to. Uh, you know, push on, on the dark horse. Well, the cool thing is, is that Josh and I, we worked together. Um, Josh actually, at one point in time, helped us develop some exterior uh, bits and pieces. Yeah, it was bound to be a good collaboration because we did all of our meetings together. It was always interior and exterior. A lot of, t a lot of times the cars developed, those two are siloed and separate. And 
Not our team. We were always at the same table, critiquing in tiers and next tiers together, talking about what we thought was too sheer or not sheer enough or you know not driver centric enough. And we constantly gave each other feedback, our two teams, and it was, yeah. it was, we were bound to have a cohesive product because we all designed it together. Either yeah. there was interior helping with exterior or or us taking inspiration from you guys. It was well, the thing is, is they, they had the interior locked up early in the game. So I was <laughs> like, hey, guys, I need some help. <laughs> so I had a couple hotshot designers working with me, and they were phenomenal. But we just had the workload was, was so heavy. So um, a lot of the interior folks, uh, Joaquin, yourself, Aiden, um, Aiden came, came over and helped. Um, yeah, Aiden did, Aiden did the tail lamps. Yeah, you, you could tell that we helped yeah. too, because like, yeah. so we've been doing this big digital screen that's you know, customizable and, and people can alter it depending on what they want it to be retro and look like a Fox body cluster or make it feel like it's space age or from the aerospace industry. And one of the designers that helped us with that help make the taillights feel super digital. You know, there's no light bulbs or little, you know, twinkly lights. It's, they're flush and, and really, really clean. And you could tell someone with experience doing digital and interior worked on the taillights as well. We spent hours with the designers and the people behind this car. And one of the things we heard over and over again is the, the budget and the allocation of time and effort on the interior space in terms of technology. Unreal Engine was mentioned so many times. The screens were mentioned over and over. And one of the big things was it was more than just sticking screens in a car. They knew customers wanted this. They want big screens. Everybody is obsessed in this market. But how do you take that? How do you put the technology in a car like the Mustang and make it all work? Yeah, so what should be physical versus what should be touched? That, that's been a pretty big kind of debate, especially with you know, larger screens. You don't have as much room for physical buttons. Um, and so that's the challenge of what actually goes into the digital versus the physical. We did clinics, um, especially around climate, to see if how do people like the digital versus the physical or if there should be a mix. And our studies did show us, our test data did show us that people don't like the mix. They prefer either all physical or all digital, but they also prefer bigger screens. So that was one of the driving forces. Okay, if they like the bigger screens and they prefer all physical or versus all digital, the compromise is going to be to put the things like climate into the digital space. It has been complex, and especially since we've been bringing in a lot of larger displays, like the Mustang, it has a 13.2 inch center stack and a 12.3 inch cluster, so it doesn't leave a lot of room for physical buttons. Uh, but with that, we have to try and balance what do we put into the digital first surface. So like in the Mustang, we put first surface the climate, a climate strip that's on the bottom. It's always present, even if you're in reverse or if you're in Apple CarPlay. And on that button bar, uh, we've used, we've added the most frequently used climate functions. It has a favorites button, so if there is a favorite feature that you want to quickly get access to, you can set that up. So still just trying to balance what we put primary on the touch screen and then still make use of the physical buttons that we have so that people still can easily be able to use the digital experience. I mean, it's, it's tough because doing an interior design, like if the screens take over the entire interior, then your digital experience better be amazing. The whole point better be you're, you're not driving the car, you're watching entertainment, you're interfacing with the car. Um, you know, somehow the screens are giving back to you, but this is a driver's car. All, the screens are only enabling you to play with your traction control and, and play with your, your GPS or whatever, but the, the digital experience for a driver's car, it just needs to enforce that, you know, the driver's a tool for you and you should be driving it. And so approaching the hard points and touch points of the car was a, a, a huge undertaking. So we realized, yeah, you could stick almost all the functionality of a car's interior into the screens, but that's not very exhilarating. There's not a lot of connection between you and the car. It, it feels 
uh, disingenuous at times. So we put as much functionality as we needed to in the screen, where there's you know not a lot of menus. We've we've got these these Mustang hotkeys that you can change the traction control and all your settings, and they're dimensional. They're dimensional buttons, and we took a little bit of inspiration from the old toggles that the Mustangs had previously. So there's still a dimensional quality to those. And then we realized that the touch points that really matter are the shifter and the handbrake. So, you know, moving away from, or not following competitors and doing a handbrake button was a, a huge choice for us to make a real handbrake and then the performance handbrake. You know, that really leans into the drift culture that Mustangs are synonymous with and really, you know, gave a little respect to the, the enthusiasts that want a real handbrake and a real shifter. And that's the touch points that we really focused on. We needed a clean slate to, to make it a, a pure idea. And I think that's why it wouldn't really work to just follow a trend or find what other cars are doing and try to do the same. Because it won't be executed the same way. The devil's in the details. So us trying to do this architecture based around the driver and everything's this cockpit feeling, that is what led to us doing a screen where the entire center stack and center screen are all canted 10 degrees towards the driver. And I'm sure other cars have done that, but everybody having a pano screen is different than us having a wraparound screen. So for us making a cockpit and turning everything towards the driver gave us better ergo, better visibility, better touch points, and then it, it just happened to bolster this aesthetic of having the car's interior wrap around you. So the screen bending in the middle is definitely a, a part of embracing that cockpit feeling and us chasing our vision, not just the competitors. The boomers are still here. I'm a boomer and we're still going to be around for a while enjoying the cars, especially a performance vehicle like Mustang. Uh, but for this seventh generation Mustang, it is about, you know, growing into the future. Um, and a lot of the time that we spent on it was basically two things that I think really will help attract that new generation. First is that edgy, sexy design that is unmistakably Mustang, but it looks fast standing still and gives that edgy look that we think would appeal to the younger audience as well as the historical Mustang customers. The second is the interior. And you know, I've worked on Gen 4, 5, 6, and now 7. You know, generally speaking, we don't talk a lot about the interior from that Mustang standpoint. Yeah, you need performance close at hand, you need the pedal feel in your manual transmission and you know the seating like from the base seating to the Recaros. But in this case, if you think about the younger generations, they've grown up personalizing their technology, right? Laying out their cell phones, their video games and personalizing it that way. I normally turn on a car within the first 50 seconds, right? I want to hear that rumble. I want to feel that throaty exhaust. I want to you know, feel that engine kind of shake. I sat in there for 50 minutes playing with the screens to kind of figure out, setting it up for the drift mode and changing my exhaust settings and changing the, the calibration like when we do the mode switching. I, I literally had so much fun in there, I didn't think to start the car. And what we do believe is that that is going to resonate with that younger generation and help bring folks in to the Mustang and the sports car segment. You know, we're kind of stewards of, a, of an icon like this. So when we're trying to figure out how much heritage to bring into the car, people have opinions on whether it should be completely heritage, completely retro, you know, a nod to everything we've done in the past. And then the younger audience really wants something new and fresh. So, you know, we don't want to design a car from the 60s again. We've done that. It was great. It was fresh then. What's fresh now? So when we went to research early in the program, we talked to younger buyers that wanted something new and exciting. Uh, die-hard enthusiasts that just wanted three pedals and didn't really care about the rest and everybody gave us the same resounding opinion that they wanted something that was immersive and made the driving experience uh, elevated and, and feel more special and tailored so for the design side it was a pretty uh, clear-cut decision to step away from heritage and address the drivers and make them feel a little more special and a little more um, sought after so that you know when they're driving the car they feel more connection to the car so for us I'm, I'm proud of Ford for making a decision to walk away from heritage and do something new and exciting to make drivers feel like they're in a driver's car
I'm at the Ford Lair outside of Dearborn, Michigan, underneath the 2024 Mustang Dark Horse, and I'm with this gentleman. Please introduce yourself to our audience. Hi, my name is Tim Smith. I'm a vehicle integration engineer at Ford Motor Company. I've been working on the Mustang program for the last couple of years. So let's start with the exterior aero. Clearly this car is fairly aerodynamic, and as we talk to the exterior designer, the shape itself has some natural benefits, but versus the outgoing generation Mustang, what did you do to the Star Course? Yeah, the era story on this, it, it was really all about balance. We, um, we always, we, you know, we continuously work on getting the good aero numbers, the good downforce numbers. Obviously drag's important to us because we've got other requirements that we need to meet. So the big story here was we were able to um, reduce the drag, and then on the aero we really focused on the balance from front to rear to get it right. And that involved a lot of tuning, um, a lot of new parts as well. Obviously the rear wing profiles are different. Um, on the front end we did some different things with the fascia. And then we did add, you can see the strakes on the bottom. These are a new part specifically for the S650 that the 550 didn't have. That also helps just cleaning up the air under the car and getting some downforce on the nose. Um, the car naturally has quite a bit on the back actually, the 650 does, so we did a lot of work on getting what we could out of the front and then trimming the rear to match. Speaking about the front, so obviously you have to balance the arrow with the suspension. And yep. one of the big stories that has carried across multiple iterations of this Mustang is the new steering rack. Can you walk me through what you guys have done? Yeah, so this is an E-Pass car, so electronic power assist. Um, the big deal between 550 and now was we were able to increase the, or decrease actually, the steering ratio went down to 15 and a half to one, so it's a bit quicker. And then probably the thing you'll feel the most is that we previously had an isolator in the steering shaft system. We were able to get rid of that, so you have a lot more direct feel. Um, the vehicle's a lot more responsive, especially on center. And you really, between that and the rack ratio, you really feel it when you're driving the car. And that's a change that affects all this generation Mustang, correct? Correct. correct. Oh, wow, that's a huge difference. Yeah, it's a huge benefit. Dampers and springs and sway bars. I know this is a non-handling pack we're underneath for the Dark Horse. You guys have a handling pack. True. Versus the outgoing Mach 1. Can you walk me through some of the technological differences and tuning differences? Yeah, so from a tuning point of view, philosophically, the, um, the springs and the bars, it's all about getting the mechanical balance right and everything. So there's some tuning in the margins there. Um, just refinements that we, you know, over the years, we've got a lot of experience with the general platform, um, so the team was able to just fine tune and tweak. On the dampers, the uh, Dark Horses all have Magnarides. It's the latest generation software, which is a step up from what we had on the Mach 1. And that really, um, the benefit there was we were able to be a lot more precise with the tuning, and we were able to manage the, uh, the control, but also the ride quality a lot more effectively than we could previously. And, that, and that's just down to the evolution of the system and the tools that we had to work with. Moving to the handling package car, you get far wider wheels and tires. You're running a yep. much stickier Pirelli tire than the outgoing Cup 2. Right. What did you do from the base car to the handling package to meet the handling targets when it comes to suspension? Tuning? Yeah, so the, the tires went from a 255, 275 package to a 305, 315, and then the move to the Trofeo from the P0. Um, and then it's just tuning around and making that tire work. We did lower the ride height a little bit on the handling pack. Um, and then it's, again, it's the same kind of thing, tune the dampers to match the tire and to match the uh, extra aero that we put on the handling pack car. We've got the bigger splitter in the front, different wing on the back with a gurney that the customer can put in if they're doing track days. So it's really the tuning of the dampers and then the tweaks to the hard parts. It's all about making that tire aero package work as effectively as it can. You said the rear bushing change in the back. Yep. Stiffer rear bar, stiffer springs. That's yep. to get a little bit more rotation out of the car as well. The character of the cars are the same. Um, as you move up through the progression, it's it's just about more mechanical. Yeah, grip. and and where do you where do you put the where do you put the response? Obviously, you know a dark horse handling pack is going to be on one end of the spectrum, and a you know entry level two three car is going to be on the other. But it's the character is kind of the same throughout, and it's just refining the package. Still a Torsen rear differential. Still a Torsen, 373 on the manual, um, 355s on the auto, final drive. When it comes to the braking system of this car, yep. obviously you have enormous six-piston Brembos in yeah. front. Is it still a traditional hydraulic brake setup, or did you move to brake by wire? Uh, it's still, well, it's, um, it's electronic brake boost, but it's still, it, you know, traditional brake by wire, like only a wire between the pedal and 
in the rest of the car, we don't have that yet. It's still it's still mechanically connected. Thank you for that. <laughs> you did, however, change the e-brakes in these cars, correct? You went away yep. from a cable to a more electronic setup. Um, if you get a Performance Pack GT or a Dark Horse, you'll, you'll also get the, uh, what looks like it presents itself like a traditional park brake. You've got the handle that you've always seen, and that also enables the drift brake feature that's only on the Performance Packs and the Dark Horses. How does that work? So normally, um, the park brake behaves, it actually actuates all four. Um, and there's no modulation, no nothing. If you go in, and we have a My Mustang screen, I think you've probably seen it, you can go in and you can turn the drift brake on. When you do that, the handle only actuates the rear brakes. And the neat thing about it is, instead of using a cable that can stretch or you need to, you know, be Hulk Hogan to pull, it um, is using the ABS pump. So you're getting, I think, 140 bar line pressure at the rear. When it comes to drivetrain, obviously big story this. Yep. It's the latest generation of Coyote. It has twin throttle bodies. It yep. makes more horsepower, at least on the dark horse. Um, walk me through why you made the change. I know emissions was a big part of that. Yeah, I mean, we've always got regulations we need to keep up with, right? And, and, and there's uh, obviously the dual throttle bodies, big, very obvious, open the hood, looks great. Also allows us to get the power. Um, there were some changes to the cam profiling, uh, duration on the exhaust cam, I think, um, cylinder head modifications, uh, oil pan, steel oil pan, um, some control from windage, and then a lot of little durability nits and nats here and there. The dark horses get a unique rod. Um, again, just for greater durability. Um, and you have base, you have real cooling solutions. You have an oil cooler, you yep. have a trans cooler yep. in this thing. Yeah, and a big part of what we do is, for, for the dark horses, we do have a track durability cycle that's pretty stringent. And so we go out and we rail the thing um, to make sure that all the temperatures stay down, we don't have starvation issues. Um, the tires, you know, to get an understanding how long the tires hold up, uh, make sure the brake fade performance is good. So it's, it's a very comprehensive, I'll say, full vehicle event that, you know, we, we test everything on it. So theoretically, as a customer, you could buy this thing and immediately after you perform your brake and take it to a track day and beat the hell out of it. Yeah, the, the, dark, the dark horses specifically, we, we rate them for, we did track durability testing, yeah. Trans, that's the last thing we haven't touched on. And thank yep. you for walking through this entire car. You have a either a 10-speed automatic, your right. in-house Ford gearbox that you yeah. co-developed, and your Tremec, you moved away from the MT-82 just for the Dark Horse, correct? Yeah, so the, the MT-82 still has a home in the GT, um, but the Dark Horse, uh, we went with the Tremec, similar to the Mach 1. So we know that, you know, the gear ratios work out for this usage. We know the customers like this transmission. It's a great piece, so we, we persisted with that. You know, there's advantage. It's, it's exciting to do an all-new, all-new, um, but every, you know, and a lot of us have been involved with all news and, you know, even one, two, three, five years after, you're like, oh, I wish we had known this. Excellent. I wish we had known that. I wish we had known. And then you'll see the next ones are better. Um, this car is similar to that. This is a culmination of, and, and a lot of the people who have worked on this car have been working on Mustangs for a long time. So there's just, there's a rolling, rolling knowledge base of, I'll, I'd like to make this better. I'd like to make this better. I'd like to make this better. And, uh, you just refine, 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 and it's it's pretty satisfying when you get it to a point where you're like, ooh, yeah, this is this is what I was imagining, however many years ago, and, and you know you just didn't have time or you didn't. There's things you didn't know. There's things you found out late in development, or and maybe, now you have the budget maybe to even do after it. a couple of years, and then hey, we're going to do a new one. A lot of it's the same or similar. It's like oh, that there's a lot of good about that. So. Perfect. Took advantage. <laughs> well, with that, I think it's time for us to go take this for a quick drive around the track. Sounds good. talk about V8s and Mustangs and dark horses. Mark, there's a Mustang checklist that I have to make sure that this car can accomplish. This is the first one. Sounds like a V8. Does burn out. S550 GT owner for 
performance pack, 7,000 track miles on that poor car. We're about to experience. Uh, uh, oh, 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 oh. Yeah, okay. actually drive like if you're a well-behaved member of society I'll tell you what it drives like it drives super easy <laughs> I came out here with a I was lighting the loafers on the throttle and I was like super smooth on the steering and you realize there's so much tire under you and the way they have the suspension set up you can just be ham-fisted and this car doesn't go nuts it doesn't you don't lose control you can really, really do stupid stuff. And I think the biggest surprise for me is just how easy it is for anybody to get into this car and put their foot to the floor. You don't have to have the wheel turned and be like, oh, should I breathe on the throttle like I'm kissing a new lover? No. Nope. <laughs> you can just put your foot into it and the car just grips, the suspension settles in. It does feel like a big car. It does feel heavy. But the way that they have the, the weight managed in this thing is great. It really is super, super fun and easy to drive. It's very approachable. So versus the last car, as someone who owned an S550, the steering in this car is remarkably better. While it is not rich with feel, it's no longer totally disconnected from the front end of the car. The front and the rear, with the latest calibration of MR dampers, do a better job talking to one another. I think the other thing you'll notice, and something that you really appreciate, Mark, is the way the brake cal works, as they work with how they dealt with the brake pressure to get this car to turn in better under trail braking. This car has a constant sort of initial push, and then if you want to get it to rotate in the rear, you need to lift more with the throttle, get the rear to come around, or a big boot full of gas. It's a very balanced car and that's sort of surprising remember like the gt500 which is a total handful oh yeah oopsie <laughs> <laughs> so mark what do you think about really one of my favorite parts about this vehicle the five liter and the gearbox um to me it doesn't sound as good as i thought it would i mean it's definitely more of a brap like a, it's a less musical sounding v8 and you know what i mean <laughs> It's naturally aspirated, it makes a shitload of power. The tuning feels really, really solid in here. And I, I mean, it is, it pulls and pulls. It's super, super strong. Um, it's less about the engine as it is the manual transmission, I'll be honest. I think the manual transmission is what sets this car apart from so many of the other cars that we, de we deal with. It, it's such a joy to not only just ramrod, but it's super, super easy to use and get it into gear. It has a strong mechanical feel to it that a lot of the manual transmissions don't anymore. So many of them are just like, feels like a, a toy. Like an like, M2. Yeah, example. like a video game. It just, it's all plastic. This feels like you're actually doing something, like it's connected to something. And that's something we talked about with the dynamics engineer about, you know, if you're gonna have a fun car, if you're gonna have a driver's car, at least have you feel like you're driving it where not everything's doing everything for you. Not everything's easy. And this car is very easy to drive, but I do like the fact that the pedal box and the gearbox make you feel very, very involved. Yes. And I think all of the inputs, whether it be the steering, the throttle calibration, the shifter feel, the brake feel, all match one another. Certain cars when you can get into, the steering's too fast, the throttle pedal's too light, the shifter feels like set up a different vehicle. All of the inputs in this car, I feel like are really well matched. You combine that with a, at least in the, the handling pack that we're in, a rear that isn't constantly trying to kill you. Yeah. And if you've come out of a regular Mustang or a less powerful performance car, and this is your first sort of track capable high horsepower car, you can get into this and go flying and not die. Oh, and then wow, if you are sure. a good driver, 
or a driver who is willing to push the car and get it to rotate. It doesn't just push and understeer everywhere. It's a, it's a, it's a very good non-Ford performance Mustang, right? This isn't a GT350. It's not a GT500. This is a replacement to something like the Mach 1. And if you like what the Mach 1 did, blending the street with high track capability and minimal compromise in both departments, particularly for you know realizing that this isn't some like mid-engine supercar, I think you'll really like it. What do you think? Yeah, I would mirror that. I really would mirror that. I do like the fact that when you do try to drive this fast, like I'm not somebody that has, I'm not choppy at the wheel, I'm not choppy at the throttle. I do like the fact that there is that balance of making it accessible to somebody that is just getting into a rear wheel high where we'll drive high performance car like this it's easy to drive but when you really do drive it at the ragged edge it doesn't get super safe on you to your point it doesn't wash out with understeer unless you do something stupid it's a really well connected car despite its weight despite the platform they're working with here i think it's the magic of them evolving the suspension yeah. the, the the way they've made these subtle changes to the suspension the dampers and all that that makes this such a really really fun car to drive and you can tell out here that not only is it going to be good out here, is it super, super compliant. The suspension feels great where you could drive this every day and have almost no penalties for it. And that's really hard to do on a car like this that can go track and street where you would have no problem taking this out and be like, oh man, this is too stiff. You're never gonna question whether the fact that this car is gonna beat you up on the road because it's just not. My question then, you know, I know we can go back and forth on the M2, but the Supra, you can get the Supra with a manual, it costs, uh, less than this, honestly. It's in the, let's say, low 60s, high 50s for a good one. How does that car compare dynamically to this one? Uh, the Supra is just, it's, it's really hard, man, because we're talking about a big difference in money. Is this car $20,000 better than a Supra? I would say it's no better than a Supra in a lot of regards, but it fe this feels like a more usable car than the Supra. This doesn't feel like as much of a, a toy, toy, even though it is a toy. But you could drive this every day and still feel like you're in a regular car, whereas the Supra is just like, yeah, you know, you're limited in terms of trunk capacity. You know, it's a two, you know, two-seater. And the front and the rear of those cars feel like they come from two different vehicles. Yes, yeah, this car does not have the problem, the BMW problem, of having a front and a back end that don't talk to each other. Although it is a softer feel in this, you do feel like the car. And it's it's not a delay, but there's a the body control here. It's definitely on the softer side, and it's by design. It's still a street car. That that might be the only thing that would set somebody off and be like, oh, it doesn't feel as twitchy or connected. But the BMWs do a great job at making it feel quick and responsive. But it's very synthetic compared to this. All right, Mark. With that though, I think it's time for us to wrap up this very long video and head into our final thoughts. Hit me with some V8. I thought you were gonna say VTEC. Final thoughts on the Ford Mustang Dark Horse. And I wanted to say this first, huge thanks to our Ford reps. Without Sam and Mike, this project would not have been possible. They spent a lot of time logistically working with us to make sure we could get all the necessary pieces. And also huge thanks to the Mustang team themselves. They clearly really do care about this car. And also Autobahn Country Club. Without them, we would not have a home to do these videos. So if you're looking to become a better driver, hit them up for their performance driving school, track day rentals, or if you wanna become a member. So what about the car? Well, let's start with the pros. Yes, this is not an all new Mustang from the ground up. It's really a improved variation on an existing theme. So if you like the old car, you'll definitely like the new vehicle. And the two biggest areas of improvement, other than arguable interior and exterior styling, is the steering and the suspension tuning. The steering is far more precise than the S550 generation. There's better feel through the rack. The suspension tuning, the front and the rear of the car talk to, them, talk to each other far better. And those two factors alone go a long way in improving the dynamics of the vehicle. What are the cons? Well, it's really expensive. Our dark horse with optional handling package was more than $70,000. And while yes, muscle cars are dying, the Camaro dies this year. In August, the Hemi goes away from the Challenger lineup. This is really the only two plus two V8 manual car you can buy. It still costs as much as something like a BMW M2. It costs more money than a Supra, a Nissan Z, and hell, it's more than the base price of a Corvette C8. 
which does mean if you're gonna buy the Dark Horse, you absolutely have to love Mustangs. The other con is the dynamic element of this car. While it is very easy to drive, you're no longer chasing the rear, you can't get away from the fact that it's heavy. It's nearly 4,000 pounds. When we weighed this car, without really any gas in this vehicle, it was on E, it was more than 3,900 pounds. So with gas, you're at that 4,000 pound mark and you can feel it in the dynamics. It's still a great car to drive, however, and with that, Thanks for watching and thank you for all the Patreons that made this video possible.